Okay, uh, my name is Ntayo Kasaya Lemu. I am uh, a unique PhD fellow. This uh, is from Slovenia, University of Ljubljana. And uh, my interview is uh, from his, his Yan, Professor Yan from University of Hong Kong. And we are making this interview uh, in uh, the University of Aarhus on the unique conference entitled University's Future. Uh, I'll give really uh, a few minutes, just a minute, for Professor Yan to, to tell us uh, his research interest. Okay, thank you. Thank you for uh, giving me this opportunity. Uh, I'm based in the University of Hong Kong Faculty of Education. I'm a professor associate dean there. Um, let me introduce very briefly my background. I think this is important um, when I express my views. Um, I have been working in university environment for, for the past three decades, uh, respectively, one decade in China, one decade in Australia, and one decade in Hong Kong. So my research at the moment focuses mainly on higher education, comparative and international education, and education policy sociology. Oh, thank you. So now we can start really our main questions, uh, which is more academic. Uh, the first question is really, uh, uh, how do you see the, the current trend of higher education? What are the key trends that, that you observe? <clears throat> yeah, in my own research, I try to avoid the, 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 the word trends, because when people use the word trends, they often imply something like, you know, this will happen, definitely. And to some extent, people may think this is a correct direction. So I, I often try to avoid this word. So let me explain this. Um, um, what is happening does not mean what should be happening. Um, so what is happening if you observe the whole world? I have to say the situations are very different. Uh, what's happening exactly in, in the Euro European Union countries and, and very different from where I come from, you know, in East Asia. But largely we can observe some, something in common, uh, quite obvious, quite obvious uh, impact of globalization, continuing huge impact and many aspects. Um, some are good and some are not so good. You know, we have heard so much in the conference. Uh, internationalization, part of this, uh, building up education hubs, um, uh, world-class universities, um, and offshore programs, all this kind of thing. So impact of globalization continue. Uh, some are good, some are bad. Another major thing is massification. So the, the, the rise of student numbers. And this has a, a, a number of uh, significant uh, implications for how we do things and, and, and um, for example quality um, and uh, traditional students uh, population disappearing shrinking and we have very non-traditional uh, this kind of thing uh, <clears throat> access um, inequality social justice and particular access uh, it's interesting on one hand um, uh, student population increasing dramatically on the other hand um, on equal access is very obvious, um, particularly in some societies. So that's a big issue. Um, another major thing is uh, financing, how education, you know, how we finance education. Again, this is very different. If you look at what's happening in the UK, if you look at what ha what's happening in the United States and East Asia, where I come from, uh, very different. But finance, fi how to finance our universities is a major issue now. Um, Academic profession is a big issue. Uh, everywhere you go, almost everywhere you go, uh, professors are under increasing pressure. They have to publish, otherwise they perish, you know, we know the saying. Um, yeah, and this has affected their morality, even, uh, to be honest, even uh, has affected their health, their family life. It's quite serious. Um, 
uh, of course, a very differentiated situation. Younger people under even greater pressure without tenure. Uh, but uh, uh, we all know the story. So uh, 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 academic profession is an issue. And another thing I think many people keep talking is ICT, uh, Information Communication Technology in Education, MOOCs, this kind of thing. Um, these are all um, happening uh, in our world. But I personally, I really want to emphasize in my eyes what should be happening. Uh, not necessarily what is really happening, or really happening well. That is, uh, to me, that's a very different my own perspective. To me, universities are cultural institutions. Um, so universities themselves, they are very cultural, and, and they should pay so much, they should pay their core attention to cultural function. Uh, but if you look at how universities are operated, if you look at uh, how we study our universities, we focus overwhelmingly on economic aspect and sometimes political aspect. We ignore very much cultural uh, dimension. I think cultural dimension is the most important because for the first time in human history, we need to learn, different peoples need to learn to live together peacefully. And we haven't learned that very well. Um, and we definitely need to learn that, I think, quite urgently. And I think that should be the fundamental uh, function for universities. But if you, seriously, if you look at many universities in the developed countries and in developing countries, no, in terms of this, not doing particularly well. That's my answer. OK, thank you. Then, really, in relation to this, this uh, happening, just currently happening. Which, which happenings are really the most challenging to higher education? And which you just, and which happenings are really positive and should be really encouraged? Okay. The most, well, the, the, the most uh, challenging, if you ask people, um, particularly those working in university, but not necessarily the best scholars in the field of higher education. You know, in higher education, we have many, many people working in, say, physics department, or administrators, or, or, or in sociology department. Um, they would certainly say it's the financing. You know, the way universities are governed, the way universities are, are, are financed. Uh, it's uh, hugely problematic in, in European unions, I think. It's uh, also problematic in the States. Uh, it is getting more problematic in East Asia even. I, when I say even, because East Asian governments are investing heavily in higher education. But they invest on one hand, they also push you very hard, uh, to, they push you to work hard. And in order to push you to work hard, they, they use uh, a lot of um, neoliberal approaches. And that has given us uh, a lot of hard time, we all know. So that, that's a very challenging. What people fail to see clearly is the unfair system, global system. I think global system is not fair. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, culturally biased and politically unfair, the global system. And that global system very much reflected in our university system in global internet university system. So the relationship between different higher education systems, between different institutions, very much unequal. And therefore the knowledge relationship between different knowledges very much unequal. Therefore it's it's it's, it's a huge issue. Um, I usually put it this way. This is fundamentally the reason why universities in developing countries which are usually non-Western. Non-Western countries, universities are not so efficient because um, what you learn formally is actually Western knowledge mainly. What you should have is to apply this knowledge very well in your own society. That's a huge challenge. Most people cannot. So um, there is a mismatch there. And, and th that mismatch has been the result of historical uh, fact. So it's not easy to, to tackle and it's still there and often very much ignored by 
people, by policymakers in, the de in developed countries and in developing countries, also very much ignored by scholars themselves. I think that's the, the very urgent issue. That's something we need to do. We need to work hard, and particularly those from uh, periphery uh, countries. I think we need to be aware. I need to say I'm not deny. I'm not negate uh, uh, the importance of Western knowledge, which is already part of the uh, uh, global knowledge system. But I think we need to respect. We need to understand local other local knowledges, and then we need to put them together nicely. And that's a huge task. That's a huge job. And by far, no society has really found out ways to do this. That's why you, I say universities are very. Um, are not very efficient in non-Western world. They are much more efficient in European unions and particularly in North America. Because when their university operate, they, they have their own culture value support them. But when the same, you know, Western model universities, which we use all over the world, Western model universities um, operate in, say, your country or even in China, or in, these universities, you know, to operate well, they have to have appropriate culture values support that operation. And, but that kind of culture values, academic freedom, for example, institutional autonomy, for example, that kind of culture values are very often absent in those cultures. So it is very difficult for these societies to operate Western model university. Therefore, leads to this kind of uh, what I call inefficacy, low efficiency. And the second one, just related to this, which part of this trends just and happenings are really positive? Which, which part you see as positive changes of higher education and therefore we can okay. just applause and, and yeah. push further? Yeah. This is very much related to what I'm, what I'm doing now. Um, for a long time, I have been writing about uh, Chinese universities mainly, but increasingly I'm looking at other East Asian societies. Um, I have always criticized strongly uh, Chinese universities. In fact, if you look at my publication, I criticize more than many uh, Western uh, researchers, including Philip Ottobach and Sam Marginson. And a few years ago, I got a major project uh, from Hong Kong government and looking at the uh, East Asian flagship universities. And why I want to explain this is because um, national flagships are very different from lower tier universities. I have to explain. So I'm a little bit more biased towards these flagship universities. But because I'm looking at the trends, you know, the positive part, the hope, hopefully the hope. So I'm looking at the best universities. And after three years, including many uh, empirical uh, data, you know, field work, um, I focus very much on academic elites and institutional leaders. I have to say, I become much more optimistic. Um, I actually need more time to explain this. Let me, let me say, the East Asian flagship universities have clearly shown what I call turning scars into stars. Because uh, East Asia, as you know, uh, in history, um, the culture, you know, culturally, although some countries politically not colonized, but culturally, all of them, culturally and educationally, all of them were colonized. And, and they were suffering um, from that kind of cultural embarrassment, you know, and, and, and humiliation. And, and they're still blind, to a great extent, they're still very much blind, blindly admire uh, Western culture. But after one, nearly two centuries, this kind of um, hard experience, when I say hard experience, emotionally pretty hard, but on the other hand, they learn they learn Western knowledge really, really, really hard. They really try their best to learn Western knowledge. After nearly two centuries, their learning of Western knowledge has achieved a very fairly high level. And then if you look at 
East Asian universities, the flagship universities, they are as good as some major, major university in Europe and North America at the moment. They are just as good. Once they achieve this level, I'm very happy, and I was very, very happy, but I was also to some extent surprised to see when I talked to the institutional leaders. Institutional leaders in East Asia flagship universities have shown great confidence. And they say, on one hand, we learn uh, Western knowledge. Um, without any reservation, or almost, you know. On the other hand, they say, we don't want to throw away our tradition. I think they have shown, let me put it simply, I have, they have shown clear signs of integration of these two cultures. You know why I emphasize this so much? Because if you look at European major universities, my job is not to criticize European universities, but if you, the reality is if you look at a major European university, if you look at a major American university, that's the best university we, we respect very much, Harvard or Princeton. Or Princeton. And this university, when they operate, there is only one culture there, that is the so-called Western culture. If you look at my university, University of Hong Kong, or uh, National Taiwan University, or National Singapore, National University of Singapore, it's clearly at different levels, but all the time, individual level, uh, institutional level, university level, and the system knowledge level, it's always at least two cultures, what I call biculturality, or even more than two in the Sing Singaporean case. Um, so multicultural even, but let me just say biculturality. And they know their own society very well, their own tradition very well. They actually digest Western knowledge extremely well. So they can easily dialogue with uh, the, the Western powers. At the same time, they have their own and that part is their strengths. And I think from a civilizational dialogue perspective, I think this is a wonderful ex ex exper experiment for human society. I personally place a lot of hope on this. I think that's exciting to observe. I'm not 100% sure this will happen and, and many other lower tier universities will follow, but I think this is an extremely hopeful sign. Thank you very much. Yeah. Do you think that they, they can really uh, pace, move on equal basis it, 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 and therefore uh, benefit the society? Yeah, for a long well, yeah, good question. For a long time, I, I don't think East Asian universities were treated equally or the same as their Western pattern, uh, counterparts. But if you look at the power st structure today, it's changing every moment. But if you look at East Asia's de development, I have to say the university development is a part of the rise of Asia. You can't separate, particularly because of the economic development. Mm -hmm. and, and I think they are getting more and more equal um, with, uh, with, uh, with uh, major Western universities. And they are very, very confident. OK, yeah. okay let, me, let me really jump to the last and third question. Uh, in, in, in the higher education environment, we see some universities are central and others are peripheries, yeah. not on, on geographical issue, but on academic performance. And more universities in the Western world are considered as central universities, yeah. and the rest as peripheries. So, and one of the happening the global happening that's taking place, to use your own word, the, or trend in general sense, is internationalization. Yes. So uh, from a periphery perspective, what are really the major challenges of internationalization, if you consider that there are challenges? Yeah, great, good question. Um, something I have been struggling with for decades. Um, um, let me say, maybe tomorrow I will talk more about this. Uh, internationalization is a term um, defined usually by, you mentioned those in, in the center. Um, understandably, I understand those, I know those people well, I respect them, I know them personally. We have been friends. Uh, Gen 9's definition, for example, widely adopted, you know, people all use this, 
to me, that definition is hugely problematic. Um, it is useful at the institutional level. It's not useful at the system level. It's not useful at the individual level. It's only useful at the institutional level. But it's only useful in, at the institutional level in Western societies. Um, and put simply, they say internationalization means to integrate, um, to, 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 inter to, have, to incorporate a global perspective or intercultural perspective into your teaching, learning, and, and research. Um, for, you mentioned, for those periphery countries, for those non-Western countries, the situation is much more complicated because non-Western countries really need Western knowledge. But Western knowledge, the, the fact is not they do not have Western knowledge or Western values. They actually was imposed, they were imposed Western values many years ago already. Their problem is not to, or to have this, to incorporate the Western value. Their problem is to integrate the imposed Western value and the value they inherit from their ancestor and put them together. For a long time, let me put this, for a long time, internationalization is not a happy experience. It's actually a painful experience. The Chinese is a typical case. You know, and, and these Western ideas were imposed to, uh, uh, to them, and they, they, they were forced to believe this is perfect, this is beautiful, this can cure all our disease, and, and, and cause a lot of trouble. And they lost their identity, they cannot use this theory, uh, knowledge to, 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 to guard their life and their work. It's a very different story in the West, I just mentioned, it because um, even you go to Harvard, you know, the Chinese knowledge about Chinese, China only exists in museums and books and, and, and East Asia Studies, there's a faculty department. It's not incorporated everywhere in the operation of, daily operation of the university. You see what I mean? So their life, in their daily life, non-Western culture, cultures, I should use a plural form, do not exist. So I think, I think the, uh, for the internationalization, different countries have very different targets. Uh, to have very different priorities. For non-Western countries, it's really, really difficult, um, but they have to put them together, build up their own identity. That's extremely difficult. For non-Western countries, for, for Western countries, it's also very, it's not really difficult, but they really need to realize they need to learn from other countries. And by far, it's actually all on lips, not really in reality. I think that's the biggest challenge. You know, we have so much talk about internationalizing. We have very little real things uh, in real life. I may, I may too critical, but that's really based on my thinking, observation for a long time. Thank you, really. Do you have anything to say? Just a few words outside, just or related to I th that? I, th I, th I think this is a wonderful project. I, uh, seriously, I, I think it's a wonderful project. We focus on not only the economic side, we, uh, we, we really emphasize knowledge economy, but we also emphasize, as, we, as our interview shows, uh, the culture aspect. And we not only look at the, um, those in the center, I think we also look at those in the periphery. I think it is a high time for us to sit together and to figure out the future, because the future does not belong to one, the future belongs to both. If I'm suffering, you will never always enjoy. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. Okay, thank, thank you very you. much, Professor Yang. Thank you. Uh, I thank you, you in, the, in, in my name, in the name of UNIC project, and the European Commission, who has mm. really uh, made possible all this. Mm. Thank you. Very thank much. you very much. Thank you.